Hello, hello. Hello. We are here. We are live. We are live on LinkedIn. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday to you. I got to say, that was some like really nice intro music. It was very calm, very soothing. And usually it's like some pump up music, but I'm like very tranquil now. I like that. Nice choice. Yeah, that was a good, that was a good choice. I found myself swaying, swaying along to the, to, to the wonderful tune. So very good. It's, uh, it's great. Um, I, I was saying backstage before we went live that uh, we had a little girl about 10 days ago. We, so we have a bunch of family over at the house. So I'm in her nursery doing the session where it's quiet. So I'm, I'm in this like rocking chair right now. So I was just kind of swaying with the music as we started. It was a great, great little intro. Well, hopefully, I mean, you're obviously probably very sleep deprived, <laughs> sat in a comfortable rocking chair with some, some chill music. Hey, we, we, give you an we did pretty good. Now. We did pretty good last night. It was a pretty good night of sleep. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Three, three hours. Three hours is, uh, yeah. It's That's tough. all you need. It's a, it's, a t- it's a tough time. It's a tough time. But congratulations uh, on becoming a new, a new dad. Well, thanks. Uh, we are here. Sales Feed Live is back. We're very excited to be talking with Mr. Nate Nasrallah today um, about building better champions, which is a topic which I'm so excited to dig into because I absolutely know I have lost a ton of deals in my time relying on people that I perhaps thought were champions who definitely weren't. I used to assume that the first person that I met on an intro call, they were my champion because they were the first mm-hmm. person that I met. And I learned the hard way about what champions can do to your deals. And I also learned the positive way of what they can also do to your deals. Um, before we dig into it, Nate, I'd love just to hand over the floor to, to you, just to talk a little bit around, around you for our sales feed audience that perhaps aren't familiar with you and what you do. So perhaps you could just give us a bit of an intro about who you are, what you do, uh, what Fluid yeah. do, uh, and, and why we're here today. Yeah, so everything that I do, content I create, the book I'm writing, the product we're building over at Fluent is all centered on this idea that sales reps don't close deals, champions do. Because if you look at the make or break moments in a deal where a buying decision is actually happening, it's always during an internal meeting when the sales rep isn't in the room. And so the question is, well, one, do you have a champion who is selling you internally? And then two, when they are selling you, what are they actually saying? And the role of a seller then is to enable their champion with a clear message um, and the content to guide those internal conversations in written form, video, which we're going to talk about a little bit. And so that's why I've been excited uh, for this session, because it's, it's a good intersection of our work is how do we create the content to help our champion sell internally when we can't be in the room with them? Um, so again, that's what I think about and build our product fluent around what I write and create content on every single day is sales reps don't close deals champions do so let's talk about that awesome yeah so let's let's do it so i think for this session what we're going to do is we're going to spend a little bit of time just defining a champion because i'd love to get in your words how you define a champion because i imagine that's a significant part of being able to enable them Mm -hmm. perhaps looking at some common mistakes i know i've definitely been guilty of of probably all of them uh in, in terms of how we categorize champions how we initially interact with people that we may define champions or what we think are champions um, and also finding them because if we haven't necessarily got them straight up how do we how do we do that super excited to dig into that and then we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on selling via champions because you're absolutely right and you can you can keep me honest here but the there's a statistic around the number of like deals which are what the number of deals which are which are uh, closed or concluded outside of on a sales call, I imagine is in the high nineties. It must be high. Or is that, do you know? Yeah. Well, I would, so I would say a hundred percent of deals close outside of a sales call because it's always going to be in an internal conversation where a decision is made. It's not like, Hey, we're on zoom. And then all of a sudden we're like, okay, give me the contract. I'm going to sign this live with you sitting on zoom, right? That just doesn't happen. But I think maybe the stat that you're referencing is some research that Gartner did that looked at the share of time that sales reps and sales meetings have with their buyers, which is roughly 15%. That drops as low as 5% in a competitive deal with a number of different sales reps all competing for time and attention on the buying team. So the lion's share, 
well above 80% of the time of the buying process won't be spent with you in a sales meeting. Yeah. And that we can feel that we live and breathe in those deals, but you're right. That's such a small percentage of it. So let's just go back a step and talk mm -hmm. about defining a, a champion. Um, and it's ringing in my ears around the, let's kind of go right to the beginning of a deal, right? If sales reps, mm -hmm. have been, perhaps they prospected someone and booked a meeting or perhaps something's come inbound. For you, what's your definition of somebody that you would know that you've got a champion on your hands? How do you personally define what a champion mm -hmm. is? Well, and this is also one of the mistakes that people make often is you can't actually know if you have a champion after that first conversation. You may have a fan or somebody that's really excited about the product, but ultimately champions are defined by their behavior. And so you need to see evidence of them moving a deal forward internally. So you can have the potential or the profile of a champion, but not actually be a champion if you are not proactively moving the deal and forward in between those sales meetings during the internal work that they're doing. So kind of the, the working definition um, that I have of a champion is you have three things to create the potential. You have influence, meaning you can change the internal conversation. People listen and they're like, oh, wow, Chris has something to say. Let me listen up. The second is incentive. There's a personal win or something that's in it for you that is tying you to the deal and will keep you attached to the deal over the course of a long sales cycle. And then the third is information, right? You know how to navigate internally. You have deal intel that can help you win together. Now, if you have just, let's say, intelligence and incentive or information to help you deliver the deal, you want the deal to go forward, you could be a phenomenal coach, right? Big fan of the product. Hey, Chris, here's some info to help you get the deal done. But if you can't actually change the internal conversation, there's no influence there. You know, it's only two out of three. But the question is, you may check all three out of three, but the question is, it comes back to behavior, right? It's like you have the potential, but it's kind of like the difference between potential and kinetic energy until you convert that potential into forward momentum and forward motion, you know, you're, you're not yet a champion. So that's how I would think about it. It's nice. It's a science lesson happening right now as well. <laughs> there you go. That's great. That's great. So, so if we take that initial, you say that initial conversation, you can't possibly know it's what happens after that. Right. Are, are we talking, we were talking about influence and incentive and intelligence influence is it is that, you know, I don't want to, the, 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 are you the decision maker? It's a terrible question, but, but how do you define the types of things that perhaps salespeople should be doing in mm -hmm. that conversation with that potential champion to be able to define that? Or is it happening after based on the evidence that they've actually gone ahead and, and done it and made some influence or, 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 and started to move that deal forward? Right. Well, you can pick up clues during that meeting. Right. But you won't know for certain until after the meeting when you're looking at what's playing out. So um, back to your comment on the decision maker influence. Now, a champion isn't always they can be the decision maker defined as the person who can say yes and sign the contract. Um, often they're pulling the budget out of something that they own, a piece of the P&L that they're responsible for. But your champion isn't always the decision maker. Oftentimes they're not, but they can influence that decision because the person who is signing the contract will look to them and be like, well, Chris, what do you think? You know, I don't know. What should we do? And then what you say is what they do. And they heavily weight that in their decision process. That's what you want to look for. And so the question is, after that, that first conversation, you know, if you begin talking and you notice like, oh, hey, Chris was actually hired by the decision maker after they worked together at a past company. The decision maker came over three months later, she poached Chris and was like, Chris, come over to my team. That's a pretty good sign. And I might, you know, ask you some questions about your working relationship. What's it been like since the start? I might pick up on some clues that would then say, okay, um, Chris, are you able to get some direct feedback from this decision maker by the time we meet again, or even pull her perspective in for a couple minutes during the meeting live? Those are all points of evidence that would say, ah, some of the clues are actually leading me in the right direction. Chris is a solid champion here. So what if they're not? What if that person is, you know, and I'm sure we've experienced this, they're researching on behalf of somebody senior to them has said, go off and discover about X product. And they've sent them on a recon mission and they've gone to do that because it's a tick box exercise. They're going to go and do it. 
Mm-hmm. What in that in that realm? Where, where do we sit in terms of being able to 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 find a champion when that person perhaps is not, or are we or is the focus on creating and building a champion within that person that we've met? Yeah. So um, there are many different roles inside of a buying committee, especially in a, co- a complex deal, which you have a, a large number of contacts. You're going to have different roles. So that first person could be your coach, right? They want to see you win. They have some intel on like, look. When um, big projects have rolled out in the past, here's who was involved, here's what worked, here's what didn't work. And then you, in addition to your account research, where you may be offering some suggestions, some some um, thoughts on, hey, typically we see this role being involved early on, maybe we could work together in order to pull their input into the deal. You could be working with that coach in order to get to a potential champion. But the question is, you know, the way you phrase the question is really important. They may be just there to do some research and tick the box. If that's the case, meaning there's probably no incentive for them. They're just like, ah, this is a task I got to get done. You're probably not going to be super interested in helping you get wider or multi-threaded in the account and meeting potential champions. And so in that case, you may just be doing a little bit of additional account research, like taking the info that you can while giving them the answers to their questions to then more proactively reach out to other potential members of the committee to try to curate um, those contacts yourself. So are you saying that there should always, and this makes sense, but always be researching and trying to understand the best kind of the names, the people and dropping those names into that early, that first conversation to be able Mm -hmm. to establish how connected they are to the people that you think will actually have influence on moving the deal forward. Yeah, most definitely. And it's it's a good point. I guess the other way that I would say this is champion building begins even before your first discovery meeting. It is a pre-discovery activity that continues all the way through the sales cycle. Yeah, absolutely. So so the kinds of, let me, I'm just trying to think, if, if you've got, we've got a champion now on our hands potentially, or somebody mm-hmm. we think that can, that has those three, the, the, the influence, the incentive, and the intelligence Mm-hmm. You're then saying that from that point, we're equipping them and we are then testing or we're seeing the evidence of what's coming yep. back. So, so talk me through talk me through what that looks like. Is that us setting specific agenda? Are we talking about setting a uh, creating a path to success? What what what, what in your world is the is, is the sense of point to be? Yeah, so so it's a little bit of both. And this is also a mistake that um, people make in testing champions. They're like, okay, I gotta test my champions, I gotta look for evidence hey, book a meeting with your CEO or your CRO. And they don't do it. And they're like, well, clearly not a champion. They failed that test. (laughs) That's not a valid test, however. There are valid and there are invalid tests. And a valid test is one stage appropriate based on the point within the deal cycle, but then also your, your relationship and who they are. And then second, it has to give something back to the buyer at the same time. Because if there's nothing that's in it for them, like how can you say, Um, that you got a clear and a valid measure of their commitment to the deal. So I'll give you an example of this. Maybe early on, this is going to be a brand new first time type approach inside of the, let's call it revenue organization that you're selling into, right? Never done video before. It's all been old school, just phones, no sort of media ever. And so they're like, will this actually work? You know, I need to make sure that I have a strong case for other people. What you could say is, well, hey, you know, let me give you a um, contact for somebody who started at this same point and has now been working with us for, you know, many years, saying strong experience. If you could give them a call before our follow up meeting on Friday to hear their experience, how they message this to their revenue organization, it may give you some kind of good insights. And then we can debrief on Friday. What do you think? So you will have a very black and white outcome. Did they make that call or didn't they? Did they have the conversation with that reference or didn't they? And you're going to be giving them something, right? It's That's like a pretty valuable, I think, point of insight. It's far better than just like, here's the case study we got from the website, you know, read it, right? So that would be a valid test, especially early on, given the context that they're coming from. So um, testing is good. Running a valid test is even better. So the the original when you said about booking a meeting with the CRO, mm-hmm. that's invalid because it's reliant on the CRO also accepting that 
that meeting. That, mm. Whereas whereas the second alternative solution you gave is more because it's in specifically in their control to be able to to do. You're asking them to call someone who you've probably or you should have already yeah. um, asked permission for and said that expecting that are you going to expect this call? Right. Let's say it was just, you know, one discovery call. I was learning some information. I don't even know if video can be um, an effective medium for us. And so the larger question in my mind is how will I message the value of video in our sales process to our CRO? If that is still a blocker in my mind, then saying, hey, go pitch this to your CRO isn't going to be a stage appropriate test. Hear how other customers talk to their CRO and how they thought about the value. Then later after you can stack up an additional test, which would be, let's go message this to your CRO. At that point, that would be a valid test. It's super interesting. So uh, do you have any other examples of other, and it's a really good point there from, from, from William, getting permission mm -hmm. from other, other clients to give out that information? What's your take there? So yeah, of course, um, because obviously they have to be a part of taking the call and engaging as well. So usually what we would do for our team is have a bank of, of references, clients who were super happy, loved us, and very willing to get on um, to the phone, meet other folks in their industry. Um, and that would even, by the way, be something that we would talk about as far as um, negotiations, like in a uh, deal, let's say somebody truly needed a bit of a discount in order to say, hey, I need to stay under this budget. We might say, hey, great. Would you also be willing, you know, if we did a couple reference conversations, you know, twice a month or something like that, um, if, you know, can we, can we do this? And so that's how one way that we would build up a bank of references. Um, so it was always with permissions and great call out there. William, I think that's a, that's a great ad. When you mentioned about obviously not just sending a case study and hoping that they, that they look at it, what mm -hmm. about, a, a middle kind of option whereby you send them perhaps a video or you send them some gated content where you can actually check whether they've spent time on it. Is that a valid test or is that kind of sort of fudging a way of, of seeing whether they have actually mm -hmm. looked or engaged with the content? What's your take there? It can be right. Um, and it, it, it depends on how strong of a signal that you need based on past behaviors. So if somebody is totally checked out, right. They're not returning emails and calls. I would I would argue that it is, I, I would be highly skeptical of you calling a champ, them a champion in the first place. But if you just sent them some gated content that they spent some time watching, I would say that's not enough. That's not a strong enough test to prove that they are in fact a champion. However, if you know that somebody has been working, they've been having some of these internal conversations going to your CRO, and then they're watching you know, a five minute gated video you may interpret that differently. You may say, given the context of their past behavior, they are likely getting some additional ideas to help them with their messaging for that next conversation. Like, great, that's another bonus point on top of that in a series of tests. And again, you kind of look at the full picture, the full spectrum of how they've been interacting with you throughout the cycle. Interesting. So on the one hand, they pass the tests. Mm -hmm. We can then say, yes, we think we have a, a champion. I'm curious if they don't, mm -hmm. but we know from perhaps the discovery that there is a clear, um, there's a clear challenge there that 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 you can solve with your solution. Mm -hmm. And there's, but then failing the test as a champion because perhaps they were just asked by, you know, the powers that be to just go and research. They've gone and researched this, and here you go. Here's my findings, and then things if they just not take it any further. What can people do there? Because we want to find somebody that that is it that is invested. What 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 what's your take there? Find yeah. The right so um, I would say you can you have to first find somebody with a potential, but then it's up to you to create or build them into a champion. People don't just automatically say like, "Hey, I'm going to spend my time, reputation, social capital internally for you." You have to build up the willingness. Um, so there's that piece of it. The second piece of it that I would say is we've been talking about champion in the singular and you want to be building and finding multiple different types of champions. So for example, you may have a technical champion. You could have a business champion. Sometimes you need multiple of both types depending on the, the nature of the deal. So what I, would, what I would do is I would say, okay, um, 
inside of the technical team? Can I find somebody that seems like they would fit the profile? Can I develop them into a champion? Meanwhile, over here, I'm looking at and saying, okay, within RevOps, I need a champion over here. Let me see if I can find somebody with good potential and then build them. And then you're kind of doing this in parallel across the different business units or teams roles that are typically a part of your deal. And when you're finding those additional champions, or is the is the 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 the, the, the sort of sick, the central point of that around the incentive piece because you want them to be bought in and incentivized. There needs to be a reason why they would go mm -hmm. the extra mile to to so is is incentive in that situation more important than them having perhaps influence or intelligence or or is it a case of them having you two or all of them ideally right well you can also by the way have a high degree of influence over the decision but you know you're kind of like um agnostic as far as the outcome like you don't really care you're ambivalent one way or the other um, and that would make you an influencer, not a champion, because there isn't that incentive there. So part of developing the champion is finding somebody where an incentive already exists. It's naturally built into a piece of their career ambition, how they're evaluated and compensated. And then your job is to try to connect the dots and make very explicit, like, look, if this project succeeds, if we do this together here's how you advance toward the goal that you have already decided for yourself is important. So you can't manufacture incentive. You can clarify the link to an incentive that already exists. And then I'll just kind of call out again, um, influencer is another role in the committee where that, that incentive doesn't exist, but they can change the decision. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to address this question from Christopher, which, yeah, I think, th thanks Jesse to put it up. So sometimes it feels like the champion thinks it's great to shop for the product. Uh, it's aligned, it benefits from an introduction, but then doesn't, they don't deserve it. Um, so in his example, it's like looking at a Mercedes, you know, how cool would that be then? And then just deciding, no, it's not right. So uh, in Christopher's mind, it's not a, a, a pricing discussion, more of mm -hmm. like an emotional issue. So yeah. I your t tips on that, your thoughts on that. It's, it's an interesting topic, um, Christopher. So it reminds me of what's called the equation for change. It is kind of a formula to think about behavior change inside of organizations. And basically what it says is there has to be three things present that will overcome any type of resistance to change, which is always more of an, a, an emotional process. It, or in other words, it can be very irrational not a purely logical calculation. So those, those three things are one, dissatisfaction with the way things are, status quo. Two, very concrete and clear first steps to move toward number three, an exciting and compelling vision of the future. And so if, for example, I may be excited by the idea of a Mercedes, but there are all these kind of uh, barriers of like, what are people going to think about me? If I'm driving around a Mercedes and they're like, are you spending your money frivol fr you know, frivolously? Well, a concrete first step that you may need to lay out to help them break down some of that fear there and to make a step toward sitting down in the Mercedes is to say, well, you know, could we pay off some of your mortgage? Show to others that you're being you know, fiscally responsible. Um, is, is perhaps this a passion for you and you want to do some of your own work on the Mercedes? There are other things that you can lay out in a very clear plan that makes that future aspiration feel far more attainable to override some of those more irrational sources of resistance to change. Um, and I would, I would be curious too, Christopher, if there is any specific scenario that you're thinking about, you know, not Mercedes, but a, a person in a deal, if you got to the bottom of like, why don't they feel like they deserve this, like they need to be slaving away, spending hours and hours on a manual process to like pay some type of penance. Maybe there was a big failure in the past. Like those things definitely exist. They're part of being human. One of the biggest, um, I felt this when I massively screwed up a project when I was back in consulting, I felt like, man, I just need to work it, until 2 a.m. every day to like pay my boss back because I screwed up his project so bad. So there are things like that that happen. And Christopher, if you drop another comment, if there's any kind of backstory there that you discovered, I'd be kind of interested to hear how maybe that story for you turned out. 
Yeah, and thanks to William and Christopher for dropping those uh, questions in there. If anyone is uh, tuned in and you've got questions, do please put them in the chat. We're going to try and get through as many of them uh, as we possibly can. Um, if we get a follow up from Christopher, we can we can we can go back to it. I want to talk a little bit uh, at this stage about building building stronger relationships with 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 uh, with, with champions. So um, you know, let's assume they they pass the test and perhaps trying to build more people into there. Um, for you, what's the most important drivers around building relationships with champions and working directly mm -hmm. with champions before we get onto like the content piece and supporting them with selling? Yeah, so there, there's a couple different um, pieces. I, I think of it in terms of three T's, trust, transparency, and teamwork. So the first, trust, like they have to believe that this is the right direction. Like w without a shadow of a doubt, we are moving in the right direction. This is a good fit for us. Transparency is all about this idea that as a champion, I don't have anything to hide from you. Like I'm comfortable, Chris, you knowing what's going on inside of my organization. And if I bring you into a meeting, I'm not worried about somebody saying something or you saying something to the rest of the team that I don't want to get out. And then the last piece, teamwork, is like I have to believe that you are going to do something in the meeting that I can't do on my own, that you're going to add something that again, I am better off with you than without you there. Otherwise, it's going to be far less risky for me internally. Because remember, long after this deal ends, I still live inside of my organization with these people. So I'm going to say, okay, do I really need you there? If so, and I, I'm sensing a specific need, it'll be like, okay, great. You know, let's keep working together. So you got to have all three things, trust, teamwork, transparency, working together and that'll that'll set you up for a good relationship good working relationship and is that a similar thing in terms of uh, you're looking for opportunities to validate that when you're having those conversations and your transactional emails with them that's that you're looking to gain evidence of of that transparency mm -hmm. exactly exactly that's right and you know it could be things like um, a champion forwarding you an internal email chain right they're like hey just wanted to keep you posted on some of the feedback that I've been hearing, that is a very transparent type action that you can look for and say, aha, uh -huh, we're getting to a good place of sharing information freely. And what about, uh, I guess, sharing results, right? I know typically I would, when I'm working with someone trying to establish things like the you know value, um, you need to be able to get a lot of numbers and things back from, from them. And historically, I've had those conversations yeah. where they're very reluctant to share it or they're very open to sharing it and we'll, we'll, we'll screen share and go through all that sort of thing. So it's that similar thing. Oh yeah. I mean, it's very clear when somebody is like playing it close to the best, they're holding their cards here so you can't see them versus when they're like, Hey, yeah, actually um, FP and a has all of the data on conversion rates at different points in the funnel. Like, let me schedule a meeting together and we can use our data. And it's like, great. Um, or rev ops has the data or sales ops has the data, whomever. And they're opening up a pathway for that information to flow freely. That's key. Yeah, fantastic. So let's let's now talk a little bit around selling with them, right? Like building mm -hmm. building a, a a case together. Um, what's the first step in 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 doing that? Because I know that a lots of us and the folks out there will be having. PDFs and decks and videos right. or presentations or demos or what's the most, um, in your view, what's the most effective way to be able to initially off the bat? I know we're going to spend some more time talking about frameworks and types of content, but mm -hmm. the most important piece is this in discovery where we're kind of establishing what's going to be the most value. Let's, let's go right back to basics in terms of helping yeah. your champions to sell for you have that conversation when you're not there. Yes, a clear and a sharp problem statement is the very first thing that you need to do. Because if there's not a problem that one is costing something, two has consequences because it's playing out with some type of strategic implication inside of the company, meaning it will be prioritized. Um, three, if you are talking about it in vague terms, right, you can't quantify it, label it. Um, and fourth, not everybody agrees with the problem. Right, there are a lot of different ways to frame up and look at a problem. Then it's going to be very hard to get somebody to do anything to make a change and to get everybody else that they need to come along for the ride to say like, "Yes, I'm on board with this." So where it all starts is framing and measuring a very sharp problem statement with those first contacts, which begins in that very first discovery session. And as you're getting some of that information, I'm a big fan of putting that down into written form 
because it forces clarity when you're actually writing this out. You can then use this in a follow-up meeting. Hey, here's what I learned from Chris. From your perspective, anything that you either want to highlight and say like, yeah, I'm on board with, or two, you see differently given your role and your perspective, and you can adapt that. And that's really important because that then becomes a soundbite that will flow through all of the rest of the business case content and any type of video, any type of follow-up conversation that you have, that's your hook. That's what you lead with. And you want some clarity in how your champion will message that, how you will record that, share it around. So that's where it all starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So building, having that problem statement, using that throughout understanding how you can address and, and, and resolve that that issue. You prefer text. Is that because it's the universal language, like your text as opposed to, as opposed to, I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about video, but when you say you, 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 you prefer text, is that you're summarizing it in an email and what's the, what, 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 what are you doing there? What's the experts doing? Yeah, so um, one, you create the kind of the baseline content, right? In an executive summary, problem statement goes up top, for example, but that is just a starting point. You can then repurpose and apply that in an email, in a deck, in a video, in a memo, so many different mediums. But the question first is, as are the words that I'm choosing to use compelling? Are these the right words for us to use? And think about like even, um, you know, I'll continue to bring it back to the world of video. Um, in when you're shooting a movie, what do the actors do? Sure, there's some ad-libbing, but how are they empowered to ad-lib? They know the script. The script was written out and agonized over by the screenwriters. And they put an immense amount of time and creativity and thoughtfulness into the words that they're putting down on paper. And it's a way for them to reflect back and say, do we agree? What do, you know, There's all, usually more than one writer. So it's a very concrete, specific way to force clarity. And then you can branch out from that with other mediums. Very cool. Yeah, that's a really, a really interesting kind of analogy, and that yeah, as you said, that kind of keeps it keeps it concurrent current through there. So we've got our problem statement. We're using that as the narrative for all of our communication going forward with 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 champions. I know that something that um, you're doing at Fluent is about using the the customer's own language. Now that might mm -hmm. be a specific fluent thing. So I might be kind of going into the realms of there, but curious just to dig into a little bit more around that, because I know that sometimes we can understand when we know that our platform or whatever we're selling can solve a specific problem. We're probably solving that problem, that same problem for lots of people and lots of businesses. Mm -hmm. So how do we flip it to ensure that the conversation and the, 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 the content that we're creating is in their words, as opposed to mm -hmm. it being, because it could easily default to, oh, well, we know that you're struggling to book meetings. Okay, well, we have a bunch of content here that can explain how we solve yeah. the solution of booking more meetings. So just curious about flipping that to being a, a buyer-centric narrative as opposed to a seller-centric narrative. Yeah, so it, you're right. It is core to everything that we do, um, kind of the, the core data work that the platform is doing is analyzing and then isolating a buyer's words over a seller's. And that's very important for a couple of reasons. First is when you think about how communication happens, it doesn't happen with like my intention and what I'm saying as the speaker, it happens in your brain, Chris, as you're hearing me. So as you are interpreting the words, what you hear is more important than what I say. So if I wanna make sure that you're hearing me, the intent of my words, I need to speak with your language ways that you are already used to communicating and, and hearing from your team. It should be an extension of that. It should, in other words, be very fluent. Otherwise, I'm speaking in a different language to you. So that is also important because, again, the person who is going to be commanding the message in the matters, in the moments that it, it you know truly matters is you. You're talking to your team internally. I'm not there as the seller during an internal meeting. So how do I make sure to script a message that you can deliver to everybody else that will resonate, I use the internal language that you all are using. So if you use the word expenses, I shouldn't say costs. If you use the word sales, I shouldn't use a more general term revenue. It's very important, the words that you use. So that's the biggest reason. The second reason is it removes some of the bias. Um, it, it can feel very salesy or external, like, oh, this person's got an agenda using this type of jargon that isn't native to us. And so it can just kind of reduce the level of resistance to hearing the intent behind the words if I, I use your language. It's kind of the, the 
fancy term for it, um, and this is rooted in evolutionary psychology, is language coordination. You would signal to other tribes that like, hey, we're part of the same tribe, like all friendly, all safe here by using the same words and dialect. Um, other words, other dialect, that would signal, hey, this is an outsider. Are we sure that this is safe? I'm on a, I'm on a monologue here, but very last point, I'll tell you the moment at which this like started to click for me. My wife and I were on a road trip and I was listening to the audio book um, of Trevor Noah's memoir. And he tells the story of growing up during apartheid in South Africa. And he had an ear for language. He was very good at learning multiple different languages very quickly and speaking very fluently. And people, he, he's also mixed race. And so people didn't really know exactly what quote unquote tribe people group he belonged to. So he could very seamlessly float in between four or five, six different groups of people and be accepted right away because he sounded like them. And, I, and it was just this perfect analogy for just human nature and how we as sellers, like if we really want to be understood in our message to land, we have to enable our champions in their own words, their language. So thanks yeah, for letting me just kind of run on there for a second. It's no, obviously my, my favorite topic in the world. So, yeah. And I think, you know, I definitely when you are as a salesperson can have that sort of almost chameleonic ability mm -hmm. to be able to understand the type of person that you're speaking with and, and, and either speak with that level. I know that in the past, if I've had a conversation with someone who's just dropping swear words and things, you know, there's a kind of certain level of conversation like, oh, okay, this is it. So that, that, it, and that just has just interesting that that translates over into, into written text. Cause you kind of feel mm -hmm. like you can, converse with people and you're you're meeting them on a level and then you know fall into the trap of well okay well I've got my standard deck that I'm going to use so I'm going to share that and of course that's not my words that's the words that have been you know generically made to, to kind of fit our boxes here's a question for you is it in your world would all content when you're building a business case with a champion and you're you're mm -hmm. providing should that always be created uniquely for them or is there ever cases where it's okay? And what are those cases if there are um, to use existing content to be able to kind of sell, 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 sell for you? Yes. So the baseline is coordinating language, using language that is unique to that account so that it is going to be well received. But there's also the next level up, which is changing language. And this is where you want to very strategically choose words to shape the way the buying team talks about their problem in a way that is going to align with your solution or the project that you want to take on together. An example of this, um, I was, uh, before we went live, I was reading a post from Kyle Coleman, Coleman over at Clary, and they talk about this concept of revenue leak all the time. So when they, when they, you know, have revenue organizations describing their problem, they want them to use terms like revenue leakage. So it's not that a hundred percent of the content is in the buyer's own language, you do want to introduce and change the way people talk about it because it's framed in a way that aligns with the, the solution that you can offer them. But I would say 80% of the content is their language, their words unique to that account. Then that next 20% is where you are very intentionally um, placing words into their mind to help them talk about it in a way that is helpful, put words to what they're experiencing. Yeah, that's interesting. And it might be quite scary for a lot of people out there because we're used to, you know, having a, and I know I've pulled from that, you know, I've got a 60 page deck and I'm like, oh, I'm going to select eight, nine, this page, this page, this page and pull it out. And, um, but 80% mm -hmm. of it's going to be in their language. That is, um, that's super interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about, about creating content as well. I just wanted to um, readdress a couple of um, questions in, uh, well, one comment and another question. Uh, so Christopher's come back. Uh, just to re just to reevaluate there saying uh, about the, the the point about change very much the point uh, the narratives are very strong always present anyone can do anything thanks Jesse and of course it's super cheap then the exact opposite always happens and nobody wants to be responsible um, so I think he's just clarifying it there no additional question there but uh, yeah the only way there's find something that hits him personally and mm -hmm. move him to reach for one of the flags on the table right on Right on. I, I think I saw another question um, from earlier that was around kind of like a reorganization, you know, when some yeah. change shakeup happens. Yeah. yeah, Corey. Thanks for joining, Corey. Um, so, yeah, as an enterprise customer due to reorganization, became a contribu uh, contributor, um, 
how can Corey go about trying to find and establish those new champions? Yeah. So um, this is, by the way, a, a big risk in enterprise specifically, long deal cycles, a larger window of time for things to change and get sh um, shooken up. So this, I'll kind of um, first highlight the point that we made previously is champion ideally isn't a singular, it's in the plural, you have multiple champions. And so you're just shifting the amount of time um, into champions who are still active. Now, in this case, it looks like your original champion who then became a contributor, like maybe they were moved to a different project team, they're not as active. However, my, my sense is they would probably still want to see you win. Right. And so what you could do is work with them to transition a warm handoff where they're facilitating, ideally like a live introduction for you to meet the new point of contact. That would be the ideal, especially because they know outside of just the hierarchy that was just kind of changed. Um, influence, social capital doesn't always sit very neatly with titles and roles. And so they may be able to point you to some leads that may be a little more non-obvious that you may not be able to find after just looking at a new org chart, you know, post, post reorg. Yeah. I'm guessing that, that in that situation, you want to do due diligence in terms of working out who the right person might be. And if you've got a good relationship with that champion, go to them and say, you know, is this the right person? See if you can get a warm, warm intro. And is that, that would be what you would suggest? Ideally. Yep. If, if they are facilitating the introduction, the chance that you start a strong relationship on the right foot increases significantly. Nice, nice. Um, let's talk about frame. We've got about uh, 15 minutes. Um, love to dig into some of these frameworks you've got around building content. I know you shared a really interesting one on LinkedIn earlier today, so I encourage folks to go back and have a look at that. Can we dig into that a little bit? I'd love to get some ideas around framework and the types of, um, of, of content and helping our, our folks watching uh, to create some really engaging content to help their champions sell. So, yeah, yeah. Well, why, why don't we start with the uh, framework that um, I shared out this morning that is called the Minto Pyramid? It's named after somebody named Barbara Minto. She developed this during her time at McKinsey, and it's a way specifically if you're creating content that you want to rise up to an executive level, which is really important because they will often own the the, the lion's share of influence in the deal. But you're going to have a very small number of minutes, a low amount of airtime with them. So the question is, how do you want to make the most of those minutes to get your message to land? The whole point of the pyramid is you put the point right up top. Like here's the big idea, the number one thing that you need them to understand. And then you build out a couple supporting points, more evidence below that, all the way down at the base. And so if they're not interested with the bottom line up front, the point of your message, then it's going to be really hard to get them down into the kind of the deeper storyline, which is the opposite when most people are creating content of how they do it, they take you on this journey. They say, basically come along for the ride, everything that we went through. Here was our first question, which led us to ask this question. And so we then discovered this, and then ultimately we got to the point, you wanna flip that structure upside down. So that's the, the first way to think about it. And again, you can apply that pyramid, there you go. You can apply that to any type of content that you're creating. When you're recording a video, you're writing out a business case or you're drafting an email, put the bottom line up front, make it pyramid style. Do you know where that comes from? Where, where our, our need to uh, tell a story is there? Because uh, you have so many interesting stories and analogies and things. I'm curious, you must know, why is it that we feel the need to kind of take people on these long winding uh, stories to get to the lots yeah. of bolts of it? Well, so, so fundamentally, we think from our own perspective, it's very hard and it is a, a skill or practice that we have to work at is thinking from your perspective versus your own because you experience everything in the first person. And so you are re essentially replaying what you experience. It's just how we, we tend to think about it, um, number one. Number two, we also tend to believe that we need to build suspense and we need to build anticipation. And so we, tr we think that we are creating more excitement by like walking somebody up to the, like the big punchline. It challenges, especially the way an executive buyer thinks they're not going to stick around for the punchline. Um, if you know, they're not hooked from the beginning. So you need to flip it around and say, okay, if I can think from this person's perspective, what is the most helpful thing for them to hear first? It's the bottom line. And then if they're interested, I'll earn the time to bring them through the full story. Yeah, it's interesting. And it always the way, like when it comes to 
talking about pricing is mm -hmm. if you feel the need to sort of wind up and explain lots of reasons before you get to the pricing, that feels a bit like you're trying to sort of sugarcoat it in something to sort of validate why it's the price before you get to the price. That's right. That's right. $99 a month. The reason for that is yeah. that's a much better way to deliver it in a pyramid fashion. So, and is that top statement or that, that the, the, the first piece, is that the problem statement? that we should be included, that's, that's the number one, the problem that you're solving, or is it something different? Ah, good, good question. So um, the, the structure to the business case framework that I'm a big advocate for that we created called the one page business case, you lead with a two sentence headline, and then you go into the problem statement. And that headline is the recommended action based on an interesting finding that somebody hadn't seen before. So, hey, Chris, we recommend that you do this by this date in order to unlock this outcome. That's based on this finding. Two sentences. There's your headline right up front. That's the point of the pyramid. Then you go into the supporting point. The big reason why you need to do something right now is because there is this big problem that has been left unaddressed. It's not only costing you something now, but it's going to it's going to grow worse, and it's affecting this area that you care about. That's the second point. And then begin, and then from there you begin to layer on kind of the other elements, which I'm happy to unpack the framework more. But short answer to your question: two sentence headline, then problem statement. Interesting. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about where video might sit in now. I know we've got lots of video <laughs> fans on 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 here. Do you have a take on how we can kind of create perhaps more compelling stories within our content with different types of media, not just video, uh, to be able to help sellers? You in terms of from your perspective what works most effectively, uh, what can sellers perhaps be leveraging to, 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 to be more successful when that conversation is, is happening without them? Yeah, so one of the ways in which I love to pair video and then the written word or written content is when you've, you've drafted up this business case, you've been working with your champion to create the content. What I would do is send over a video of you delivering it, your intonation, your pacing, where are you pausing, what are you really spending some time emphasizing on? Like if I get really excited like this, or if I'm like, you know, this is a problem, like comes across very different, right? And so how you're, the words, number one, are very important. That's, that's the foundation. But the delivery of those words is also important. So for my champion, what I would be doing is just recording like, hey, you mentioned that you're going to go talk to your CRO on Friday. Um, I thought I could just share a quick run through of how I would think about um, sharing the narrative that we worked on together. And then I would just kind of go through it. And it is far easier for somebody to imitate and mirror what they've seen, heard, listened to, than to try to kind of make it up on their own. Because again, you do this all the time. You as a seller, you're, you're like spending an hour with Chris and I to learn about this stuff. That's a, and that's amazing. Your champion probably isn't doing this. And so it's on you to help kind of guide them. And that's how those two mediums can work together beautifully. Yeah, it's really interesting. I I know in the past I've created video proposals that did the opposite. Like you just talking through all of the things, and it just takes too long to get mm -hmm. to the actual point. So creating shorter, punchier content that specifically um, serves that at top of that pyramid is 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 really key. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on to objections and any other like final thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other the specific frameworks that you thought would be good at this point to share? Mm -hmm. There's one, one other one that I would give to folks. It's called the strategic soundbite. And the basic kind of uh, format is because of this big change that is happening in your world, now is the time to take this action. Be prescriptive. When you do, you'll unlock these positive outcomes. Good things happen. If you don't, these costly problems or bad things will continue to happen. And the whole point is it's, it's essentially rooted in the meta narrative that is present in every story ever. Um, it came, um, it's kind of a sales specific application of Joseph Campbell's work in the hero's journey where he looked at kind of the story architecture of every major story. And it's essentially, there's a character where something changes in the world, a big shakeup that forces them to act. Are they gonna go out on their own or are they gonna shrink back and give into their fear? Now, if they go out on their own, you know, they prevent the, 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 the tragedy, the, the bad ending and they unlock the happy ending, the comedy, right? That's what we live for. And that's what our, our brains are wired to understand. So if you apply this to a specific company, it's like this change in your company as a result of this industry pressure is happening right now. 
So you need to make a decision to act. When you do, you unlock these good things, you avoid these bad things. That's that's the strategic sound bite. And is it is a way to compress everything that you talk about during the deal cycle into just a couple sentences. Does that work better in non-competitive situations? Because I'm guessing you have that sound bite. Are you reiterating what other companies are offering, or does it still have as a equal value when you're you know you're in a competitive situation with perhaps three or four other vendors that are able to offer and solve a, the same problem? Oh yeah, a competitive um, deal is a awesome use case for it. The reason is that when you're talking about how you frame the change and then the action, the decision that they need to make, that should be rooted and anchored in your unique differentiator, something that you can do that the competitors either can't or don't do um, as well. It's not core to their offering. And the more you can clarify this, the more you can create an accurate description of what's happening in their world, like, oh my gosh, they understand me. And the more you can clarify, look, you stand to gain all of these things and avoid all of these things, it communicates understanding. And if I believe you understand me better than anybody else, I'm far more likely to believe that the action you are recommending I take with your product is going to be a better fit as well. So a competitive deal and RFP, great example um, of how to deploy that framework because I, I bet you will be the only one in that field of sellers who is bringing that level of clarity to the deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's super interesting. And I'm just, yeah, I was just thinking about the, the need for that strategic soundbite, which sounds, you know, very, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's ringing lots of bells for me, but should that be something that you are defining directly with your champion or champions before include, are you, are you, are you defining that based on the conversations you've had working out that strategic soundbite and then mm -hmm. before you're making the content, taking it to the champion to say, this is, this is what I, this is what I'm going to create. Is that right? Both. So you are creating this on your own first in your pre-discovery work before you approach and have that first conversation. So you're bringing some type of hypothesis essentially that you can test, refine and validate alongside first that champion, but then as your reach expands to other contacts in the buying group, it's going to continue to evolve. So bring a point of view. Start with something that you've created and then update it along the way. Okay, interesting. Um, interesting point there from a, an anonymous LinkedIn user saying about uh, when it comes to video. Your thoughts on mm -hmm. this building like microsites? Obviously, deal rooms are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, mm -hmm. Curious of your take on on things like deal rooms. Um, this is a you know in this suggestion they've said about a microsite landing page that tells the narrative that uses video. A lot of deal rooms, obviously, you can have lots of. Uh, different content. Vidyard have just launched Vidyard Rooms. So, just curious, your take on deal rooms and the mm -hmm. value that that they can that they can bring for for champions, or perhaps some of the sticking points and challenges where they don't work. Yeah. So, um, great topic on both sides. So, um, where they're incredibly helpful, uh, big value add is, for example, you can add different types of media, like a video testimonial from a client. Perfect example. Um, so you can use a number of supporting types of materials so that if somebody wants to go deeper down that pyramid, give me more information, help me dive in, um, it's all right there for them. Um, and it's created for that account. Now, where deal rooms can go wrong or go bad is go back to the point of creating content using the buyer's language. If your deal room is there as a function to say, duplicate, 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 let me slap a new logo on there. Well, that's that's besides the point, right? We've just ignored the entirety of this conversation because it's not actually helpful in creating the message and the content that the champion is, is going to want to communicate. So it's less about, do you use a deal room? Do you not? It's about how are you placing content created with your champion and their language inside of that deal room for them to share. So that's the core. Look at the process and the types of content that you're creating for your champions. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. I just wanted to dig into one final question around objections, which may be mm -hmm. un unearthing a whole new kind of <laughs> fish with a couple of minutes to spare. But I did just want to just quickly touch on it. Um, you've got a great champion. Um, mm -hmm. They've got you've created some great content. You've enabled them with it and they start to receive objections from others and resistance from within the organization. Does that come back to 
the things we were talking about before, right? Them having the 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 the, the incentive, the intelligence, the influence to be able to, to to battle that, and of course having the transparency for them to come back and say this is the objection. Like, where is it all mm-hmm. a kind of combination of those things? Having that relationship there, or is there other things that sellers should be thinking about with their champions? So yes, for sure. So for example, when a you can call it your inside sales rep, you know, your champion who is selling internally, when they get hit with an objection and they give a response, are people going to trust them? Are they going to have the uh, level of weight that you want and need in their response? But the other piece of this is like, think about, okay, so you as a seller, when you are um, ramping up into a new job, you're onboarding, what are you typically given? Some type of battle card, right? Here are the objections that you're going to hear. We see these in every single deal. Here are ways to reply that are helpful for the buyer. We've tested this on live calls. So in other words, a core part of sales enablement is objection handling. You're going to hear this respond in this way. It's helpful. You need to do the same thing in champion enablement or your buyer enablement. They're going to get these objections internally. The first time that they hear these shouldn't be when they're alone and without you. You need to be calling them out, prepping them, and talking through them during your conversations live so that they're ready and they have a helpful, thoughtful response to disarm that objection and to keep the deal moving forward. Amazing. Thank you so much. This has been a great session for me personally. It looks like we've had loads of great engagement in the chat. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, the floor is yours, Nate. We'd love to, just to pass over to you. Uh, people are on LinkedIn, so I guess people can find you on LinkedIn. But what about if they want to find out more about Fluent? This is your chance just to talk a little bit more about you and, and what you do and where people can find you. Yeah, well, um, first, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this session for a long time. So um, I'm grateful for the time that we got to spend together. And uh, if you want to read a little bit more, you can, um, of course, LinkedIn. And then also you can check out fluent.io. Um, we have a blog where I write long form on all of these topics, writing, creating content, selling with champions. And then you can also check out a bit about the product if you're curious there. Um, think of it as generating or drafting content to guide your champions as they sell internally using their own words so that you don't have to kind of write from scratch content that you may want to put into a deal room. Um, for example, with Vidyard, we can create that and then you have a uh, fast way to build fluent narrative content for every champion. Um, so that's a bit about us. And um, Chris just wanted to say thanks again for having me. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. It's been super interesting, and appreciate you even more so having a a, a ten day old baby Lucy uh, there in the house. So, <laughs> uh, if any folks aren't following Selfie as yet, check us out on YouTube and TikTok and all places. And um, yeah, thanks again, Nate. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the insight. Um, yeah, we'll see you folks on the next one. Thanks so much.